Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our meditation today comes from our second reading from Acts 2. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern, Dear Friends in Christ. Watch your language. Ever consider or ever notice what a strange expression that is? Watch your language. Don't we usually listen to language rather than watch it? But maybe that's just the point here today. Some of the most intractable disagreements can be traced to differences of language. This is why translation plays such a key role in diplomatic discussions out there. It's highly important to get language right. As the embarrassing incident that took place back when President Jimmy Carter made a state visit to Poland, one which attracted a great deal of attention because the Cold War was still going on at the time. The eyes of the world were on President Carter and his efforts at international reconciliation. President Carter began his speech in Warsaw by saying in Polish, I have lustful desire in my heart for the Polish people. That, of course, was wrong. What he meant to say, of course, was I have a great love for the Polish people. The problem a U.S. Army translator who didn't know Polish very well, he translated it incorrectly. Fortunately, the Polish people, while confused at first at what President Carter said, responded with humor and grace, and an international incident was averted. With that in mind, we could have a sermon about what we say and how we say it, the way parents use this expression with their children or with other adults when children are present. Watch your language. Maybe you've used that with your own children or with others around. And we have to deal then with those obscene and those, those irreverent and those disrespectful words, the rebellious and inappropriate language that's out there when we're around certain people or around our children. In fact, in our first lesson from Genesis this morning, it presents the language problem just that way. There on the plains of Shinar, People were beginning to say things they shouldn't have been saying because as God so quickly observed as he looked down there, for he was watching their language, what they said, they promptly went ahead and they did. In the Bible, words are important. When it comes to language, this is a biblical insight that we do well to pay attention to and to bear in mind as we read scripture. In fact, in the Hebrew language, the word for word and the word for thing are exactly the same. A word is a thing. So, in the Hebrew way of thinking, you can almost watch your language. See the things you say happen. My word shall not return to me empty, the Lord said, but it shall do what I sent it there to do. And the best example of this in the Bible was at creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It becomes a case of watch your language work. Pentecost, it's a great example of the fact that words accomplish something. Joel's prophecy that when the Spirit was poured out, people would speak, young and old, sons and daughters, even slaves, and things would happen. In John, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit will testify on my behalf. That is the language of language. See the things you said happen. Maybe we should back up just a bit here and talk a little bit about language in general. There was a man who was traveling in England back in the early 2000s as an American, and to an extent he knew the nation's language. He had a pretty good command of it, There's a saying attributed to George Bernard Shaw that is this, England and America are two great nations separated by a common ocean and separated by a common language. And that's exactly right. In England, they say bonnet. We say a hood. In England, they say a bank machine or cash point. We say ATM. And the list goes on and on. Well, for four weeks, this American traveled throughout all of England. The native population, they were very patient with him, with him always asking them to slow down in their speaking. 
and their rate of speaking so he could grasp it. He knew the language of England, but with the way the English people speak and the phrase, how they phrase their sentence and the way they put accents on many words and the use of words unique only to England, it often took careful listening by this man and that's why he asked them to slow down in order for him to understand their message. He joked that there wasn't a bus driver in England he couldn't understand the first time. What a true blessing it is that we can communicate. That we hear, that what we hear and what we utter may mean something and it, therefore it can do something. Scientists and anthropologists like to point out that the ability to speak is the major difference between us as human beings and animals. How is it that we hear the people said on Pentecost? And we'll stop there for a second. That was their first amazement. Language works. How is it that we hear, and then it goes on in our text, we hear in our own native language. That was their second amazement. Look at the list of languages in the reading and what do you notice? Listen to that list again. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Jew, Cretan, and Arabians. What language do you not hear listed in this list? What language isn't listed? Anybody? English isn't listed here. English isn't among the list here. English wasn't even used at this time. It wasn't a part of that list because it wasn't a language used at that point. It isn't among them. English as we speak it wasn't around. The, even the English of Geoffrey Chaucer 1400 years after Pentecost wasn't nearly our native tongue. How is it that we hear in our own native language? And our text goes on and says, the mighty works of God. That's the third amazement in this Pentecost account. It's the real point of this whole language thing we talk about here today. The wonder is, isn't just that we can communicate with each other. It's that God can communicate with us as well and he does. And when he does, something happens. We are taught by Luther in the small catechism, the Apostles' Creed, the third article, that the way we become children of God and have everlasting life is the way it happened at Pentecost. Luther tells us the Holy Spirit has called us by the gospel. We hear in our own language about the mighty works of God by the grace of God. The Spirit will testify on my behalf. Jesus goes on to say in John, you also will testify. In other words, watch your language. Watch your language do something, accomplish something as you testify on his behalf. Since the Holy Spirit has testified to you about Jesus, you now have something to talk about, something to speak about. Parents can tell their children and grandchildren about Jesus. It sounds so basic and easy, but it works. And it's the only thing that does, does work. Watch your language. In school, children can stand up for what they have been taught, even when the temptation seems so great. The expression, just say no, has say in the middle of that phrase, doesn't it? Watch your language. People in the workplace and, and out and about can develop and maintain a reputation then for the kinds of language that they use and don't use, the kind of actions they engage in and they don't engage in, what they tolerate and what they disapprove of. Watch your language. In one of the volumes of the legend of, of Paul Bunyan, there's a chapter entitled The Winter of the Blue Snow. Anybody ever read that chapter in one of those volumes, The Winter of the Blue Snow? Nobody did last night either. Do you know about blue snow? That sometimes it is so cold that your lips and your fingers and your toes turn blue. Well, that winter in Paul Bunyan's Great North Woods, it was so cold that even the snow turned blue that year. 
And for a while it was so cold that the lumberjacks couldn't even speak. Whenever they tried to speak, the words they spoke would just freeze as they came out of their mouth and they would fall to the ground, frozen. Well, Paul Bunyan had been concerned about some of the language his men were using anyway, so he made them go out and gather up all those words they had spoken and store them in the ice house where they could look at them every day. He made them look at them every day. Watch your language. And when spring thaw finally came, they all had to sit there and listen to all of those words. And they were not very nice words. But it cured his lumberjacks of their profanity. Watch your language. Maybe Paul Bunyan had the right idea the winter of this blue snow. Maybe Pentecost is a time for us to think about it. If your words were frozen and later thawed out for review, what would they accomplish? For you see, Pentecost teaches us that accomplish is what words do. Good or bad words, it doesn't matter. The language of the Holy Spirit has brought you to faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and now it's your turn. Your language can accomplish something too, and will, whether you mean it or not. It can mean the difference between joy and sorrow, between hope and despair, between action and apathy. And we dare never forget the most serious one of all, between heaven and hell. Watch your language. Amen.